So somebody gave me Bitcoin yeah. in 2014 at the beach in Korea. Yeah. And I was like, man, what is this Bitcoin vibe? It's like, guys, yeah, like ah, you, you can trade it, you can use it to buy stuff. So I had the Bitcoin at the time until I came to Kenya and then somehow I lost the keys to that Bitcoin. Welcome to Hustle Yangu Show, where we tell authentic African business stories. Today we tell the story of a cybersecurity expert and lecturer whose tech journey started during the internet bubble. But before we go ahead, hit the subscribe button and the bell so as not to miss any future episodes. My, my journey in tech started when I was pretty young. I was about 10 years old. No, let me say six to seven years old uh, when I started getting a lot into computers. Uh, started with MS DOS, started with uh, Windows 3.1. I don't think people even understand what three, Windows 3.1 is like. And basically, I, I just enjoyed trying to work with computers at the time. Um, used that for some time, started to learn how to do basic programming, computer viruses, uh, how to create them, because I feel I felt like it was fun. And then a little bit of gaming uh, at the time before I uh, later became a bit more serious with it. That was when I was in Ghana. Yeah, when I came to Kenya is when I started getting a little bit more deep into it. And I thought I'll become a software engineer. Uh, that didn't work out too well. I started leaning towards more cybersecurity, ethical hacking and everything. Um, and that started in high school. So did high school, um, went on for some time. Uh, in, and then when I went to Daystar University is when I went on it on steroids. Now it became my everyday life. Um, I read, read, talk cybersecurity every single time. Um, later became, did my master's PhD in South Korea, all in cybersecurity and did a lot of work, consultancy work for companies like Kushahidi. I started working for Cellulant at the time and it, that went off for so long. Later went to work for Internet Solutions, which is now Dimension Data or NTT as the change in the name. Um, and then later I went to work for a company called Zatova. I was a CTO, uh, building a machine learning algorithms, uh, leading a team to build insight within using data science and do a lot of ML and AI work. Uh, and then later to Mara, where I am now. However, I still I lecture Strathmore, I lecture about four courses uh, in cybersecurity, and I run my own cybersecurity company called CyberGuard Africa. And I run this uh, little initiative called Africa Hack On, where I teach people about cybersecurity. So I keep on learning every day. I don't think the learning is ever going to stop anytime soon. Starting out as a software engineer back in early 2000s wasn't easy, especially if you were from Africa. No, but then, I mean, it was basic coding that you can find. Uh, it was difficult to be able to actually learn such kind of languages for me at the time. I think my love for it was not as passionate. I wasn't passionate about it as much as others, but I had to learn basic coding for me to understand every kind of code because of cybersecurity. Then right now, we are in a space where we're getting into Web3. Uh, Web3 area, which we are seeing decentralized applications being created, smart contracts where you're having codes to be able to determine um, the, 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 the conversation between two people. I mean, the kind of transaction between two people. And that is bringing a whole new world. Um, it's not too different from Web2 because the same kind of vulnerabilities and issues that you find in Web2 are still in Web3. The kind of... Um, uh, how do you call it? The technology is not too different. It's just cryptographic algorithms that are being written by people and then they get into Web3. Before you, if for Web3, most people have to learn a Web3 programming languages like Solidity or, and, and the likes. But guess what? There are people like Circle who have made applications that, I mean, blockchain application to create for you, for you to create wallets without any kind of, um, how do you call it, a Web3, uh, I mean, a Web3 code is like Solidity knowledge. It's making it easier for people to be able to get into Web3 now. And I think it's just more education that will help us to get there. In the early days of Bitcoin, Dr. Bright was lucky until he lost the keys to his treasure. Well, I started with cryptocurrencies. I, uh, how I got into Web3 or blockchain was when crypto, I mean, I read about cryptocurrency. I think everybody read the first paper by Satoshi. Um, so somebody gave me Bitcoin in 2014 at the beach in Korea. Yeah. And I was like, man, what is this Bitcoin vibe? It's like, guys, like, ah, you, you can trade it, you can use it to buy stuff. So I had the Bitcoin at the time until I came to Kenya and then somehow I lost the keys to that Bitcoin. I think by now I would be, I'll be the millionaire. Uh, but anyway, that one is gone. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> it's gone. Um, 
So later, much later, so I started seeing a bit of blockchain, studying a detail about it, and I did a blockchain security course. And much later is when I joined Mara, when I joined Mara last year, is when I started seeing that blockchain, I started seeing the entirety of blockchain because we built a layer two chain, and that layer two chain is the first in Africa. And to build that was a big learning curve for me. I had to learn all of the details of how to build a layer two chain, but still using web two applications like, um, I mean, uh, it's not entirely a web, web three, um, uh, because we still use AWS, but we have to build code into that, which was pretty good. I think that was one of the biggest projects that I've done this year. Yeah. Being a cybersecurity expert is also kind of being a hacker because you have to know the game to beat them at their own game. Uh, I found some vulnerabilities in the government systems and I reported it. I found vulnerabilities in Safaricom. I reported it and I got Safaricom actually compensated me for that. Uh, government, of course, you know, you don't get anything really uh, other than a clap and thank you. <laughs> I found some uh, vulnerabilities in some telecommunication companies, uh, some ISPs, where you can actually get to change your billing and change your internet speed and stuff like that. I found, um, those were the fun ones, I guess. Uh, and not just in Kenya, but I'm talking about other countries as well. Uh, in Ghana as well, found so we did a whole. It's the time I did a vulnerability assessment for a bank, and we compromised the entire bank because of their mobile application. Um, as a whole bank, I mean, for, and head to toe, uh, and it, and I keep on getting to encounter new new ones, and none of them is really my favorite because they're all interesting to me. Yeah. What about the web? Web3, I've not done any, I've not, I'm still learning. I think the Web3 learning curve for security is going to take me some time because man is, is diff it's different. It's a bit different um, when it comes to breaking smart contracts and everything. So I've not done too much security for Web3. I'm still learning. Okay. Yeah. But do you think uh, it's easier or it's harder to break into Web3? No, I don't think so because you see, the, 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 the understanding of the architecture and technology is still there. People have that idea. People have access to 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 the to details of what it can it can it can be broken. If you, if you see the news around, there has been so many Web three um, how do you call it security that has been broken, especially when it comes to cross bridge um, how do you call it architectures. So people have lost a lot of money. Even a lot of phishing attacks have happened. And I think scammers have jumped onto the, the space to start telling people, look, we can help you to, to do your Web3, uh, to, to do your tr trading. Uh, so give us your money, we'll put on a platform, you're gonna make extra amount of money. But it's just JavaScript to show you some nice graphs and you think you're making money, but it's, it's all fake. So those are, I wouldn't, those are there are many, a hack is a hack. It doesn't necessarily have to be typing of commands and everything, but phishing is also a hack. So there has been a lot of significant amount of money lost when it comes to cross-chain cross bridges. Um, and that has been going on for some time now. Securing his first job proved a formidable challenge, a testament to the competitive tech landscape. So uh, I'll say that was, so when I was an undergrad, I tried to get a job with the cybersecurity company Unfortunately, after the first job that I did for the lady, um, she never paid me, so I just left. Um, I was still trying to learn the space. Then I got a job at Celluland as an intern. So I was an intern at Celluland just when I was graduating. Um, so I did that for almost two years before um, later leaving. And when I came back, so I was still working for Celluland in between the time I was studying, my four years of studying my master's and PhD. When I came back to Celluland, I became the head of cybersecurity. So that was a very good transition for me. Uh, but I started as an intern at Cellulant. That was, that was, I would say, my first true job. Yeah. But other than that, I've done other, other small time internships, which are just fixing computers and, and stuff like that. Nothing really, yeah. In tech, a gig can seamlessly transition into a job interview, showcasing the industry's dynamic nature. So was, a friend called me. Um, told me, hey, there's a, a, somebody want me to come do some training for some, for some uh, Web3 developers uh, and, and thought leadership, which they're going to do in Masai Mara. And it was called Hack the Mara. So I was going there to speak to students about building a team, um, how to build a team, how to do cybersecurity for your applications that you're building, how the team should be formed and everything. 
So I went to Mama Saimara. Basically, I went there just to talk. And I talked, 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 talked for like almost two hours straight to people. And after I finished, at that time, actually, I was being interviewed for a job in Dubai, which I did the, the interview there, um, finished the interview. I actually passed. So that was on a Saturday. I think it was a Saturday, yep. And Friday was, I think it was a Friday. Did the interview. Then on my, uh, when I was finishing, Mara's like, hey, could you, I think you can join us because your skill set will be really helpful to our team. Yeah. So I did a few more interviews with Mara, almost four of them after that. Um, so I did one, I did one on Monday. And at the time on Monday I was doing that interview, I was almost being confirmed. The other one in Dubai also confirmed. So I had to now choose between the two. Uh, but I decided to stay in Kenya because of uh, the other job was going to be basically, you know, managing the team and everything for cybersecurity. But it wasn't too exciting for me, if you ask me. But now Mara was a little bit, you know, different for me when it comes to, to blockchain. Juggling roles, Dr. Bright serves as both a Mara cybersecurity expert and a lecturer at the Strathmore University. Uh, what do you call an adjunct lecturer? So I just teach a few courses here and there. Um, and trying to teach students about cybersecurity in different courses. I do pen penetration testing uh, classes, I do IT security projects, advanced systems audits, and uh, emerging technologies in uh, IT and cybersecurity. Teaching all of those, you are engaging people in different thought leadership and mindsets, right? Uh, I do a lot of speaking events. I've done 310 so far. And those 310, I'm basically trying to understand Every time I go to, to speak, I thought I'm giving, but I also end up learning. Yeah. Not just for me speaking or the audience questions, but also what other people are presenting. So I like that challenge. Um, it's, it's, it, it keeps my mind going. And you know, it's a, it's a, we're in a space where you have to constantly learn something new and something different. Dr. Bright, immersed in Kenya's Web3 community, distills his thoughts after numerous interactions. The Web3 community in Kenya is big, but it's big, it's vibrant. I can see a lot of people are actually very um, enthusiastic about it. However, there's no collaboration, right? Every event wants to shine on its own to make a little bit of money with somebody who's trying to come in. But we need to actually have a lot of, we need to start having a lot of collaborations to be able to make sure the community grows. That right now, people are doing things in silos. So you're seeing they're trying to favor one kind of an entity, which yeah. is not going to work. I mean, we have to start embracing the, the base technology, which is blockchain, right? If we give basics to people, be able to understand, then guys can divert anyhow you want. You don't have to use a particular kind of a protocol to be able to be successful. But right now, we are doing things in silos. We need to make sure we come together. Secondly, we need to make sure that any kind of things that we're trying to build, we are building to be able to actually solve a real life problem in Africa. Otherwise, we'll keep on having <laughs> more and more events, more and more workshops, webinars, Twitter spaces, but nothing is coming out of it. And we need to actually make that change. After overcoming learning hurdles, Dr. Bright founded a community for software engineers, fostering collaboration. So Africa Hackon started about 10 years ago, uh, actually 10 years ago right now. We, I saw the need for people. It was difficult for me to learn cybersecurity without having a community or people that I can study with. So we started with a small team and it's kept on growing. And now thousands of people have been able to actually learn a lot through Africa Hackathon. So we do, um, we used to do a monthly events, but it became a bit expensive for me. Um, so now we're looking for some funding, which hopefully will come very soon. Then we're trying to see how to get also um, from, uh, how do you call it, the perspective of, um, uh, do, we do master classes. Uh, so we've got sponsorship for a few master classes that we did and it's becoming a good thing right now. Um, so Africa Hackon just tried to teach people, young people especially, how to become cybersecurity engineers. And that has been changing lives for some time now. People are becoming real gurus in cybersecurity. Um, and I, I, so far, I love, I love how far it's gone. Um, so looking forward to the next species of people. And every time we do this event, you see that there's a new breed of, of engineers who are coming and with their new thought processes, the way they actually get to, to, to present themselves and everything. So we're doing it for the young people uh, and changing lives in that space is what we're trying to do. Sometimes being robbed helps understand the need for an electric fence. This is similar to cybersecurity. I think a lot of people in the corporate world don't understand what we do. 
So especially starting, starting with hiring managers. Some hiring managers will start saying, yeah, um, uh, they want to hire a cybersecurity engineer for networks, yet they want this person to have a CISSP certification, which doesn't make sense, right? CISSP is a managerial kind of, an, of, a, of, a, of a role, but you want a junior cybersecurity engineer for networks or for incident response. So there needs to be a lot of communication to, to senior management. I do a lot of those trainings for senior management to boards uh, and executives understand what cybersecurity really entails and what can they do. Um, and that has been, that has been a good thing for some time. Um, so the more we get to do that, the better. Um, but those are the challenges. I feel like a lot of people are not really understanding why they need cybersecurity. The thing is about tools. Tools are there to do one, two, three, four activities, but you need to be able to have, um, how do you call it, more uh, practical demonstration. Let them see scenario, use cases and scenarios where they can be built into, into their project. Yeah. Dr. Bright envisions the flourishing growth of the African tech industry as a driving force. We want the next best talent to come from Africa. We are we're already seeing it. People are, there are so many Kenyans and Africans and Ghanaians, South Africans who are represented out there to be cybersecurity gurus and software engineers. Look at Kenya right now. Kenya has about 500 developers for Microsoft alone. AWS is stationed here. All the HQs are coming to set up here because they can see the future of where a software development or software engineering is going. Uh, we've seen successful businesses being built. Uh, we've seen unicorns that are coming out very soon from Africa. So, and all have to do with software engineering. Innovation can never stop. We need for innovation to continue, we need to produce more of this talent. So creating a ripple effect is something I keep on saying everywhere I go. I can teach somebody to teach another person to teach another person. And the more we keep on doing that, the better we have to build um, the space. Yeah. Also, there's something I forgot to ask. What do you think is the impact of AI on software engineering? AI is here to stay, and a lot of people don't want to embrace that, but it's here to stay. Before, it would take me almost 10 or 30 minutes or 40 minutes or one hour to write a script. AI is here to make sure that it's actually done faster and also get to be better. And the more we feed it, the more it's going to actually write that code for us. So we're going to do things faster, easier. Uh, we have something called no code, where you actually create an application, so even a website without coding, uh, just clicking and dragging and writing functions for it. So AI is going to be here to change a whole lot of the entire industry, not just software engineering, from creatives to me the media to everywhere. So it's better we, understand, we start embracing all the AI tools that are there so that we can actually get to, um, to have things done faster. Dr. Bright's advice to upcoming software engineers is succinct. Embrace challenges, persist in learning. But the best way to learn is to teach. So try to teach somebody something you've learned and then you get something back. If you don't get to share such information, you're not going to learn anything. So the more you share and then consistent practice, the practice, practice, practice. Otherwise, you'll forget about these things. You see people in who are uh, very senior people in organizations right now uh, as head of, say, software engineering or head of cybersecurity, but they've not touched anything almost five years now. Lecturers needs to also change. Some lecturers have not learned anything new for the past four years. They're using the same slides over and over again, and there's nothing new they've read or be able to bring to the table. So young people have to keep on practicing, keep on sharing, keep on learning. That's what I can say.